A man puts on a uniform to serve his country should be brought back once he serves and brought back to his loved ones. So I like to speak out about that. Make sure, whatever you do, that you never let this happen again. God forbid there should be, ever be another war and other men forgotten. We did. He just turned 20 when his chopper went down. He searched for survivors, he wasn't found. He was missing in action, still in. late 1970, I was involved at the time uh, with a study on the Vietnam War and the, the logistics and, and the support for the South Vietnamese military and the South Vietnamese economy. I was at that time working with General Electric Tempo, which was a, a think tank, an advanced think tank for General Electric. And from that, I was asked to, uh, to come to the Pentagon and to take on this role that I had uh, Soon after I got there, the Prisoner of War and Missing in Action Task Group was established to coordinate all PWMIA matters within the uh, Department of Defense. And uh, as chairman, I, I, I had a committee that was composed of all the uh, senior representatives of all the departments and offices in the um, Pentagon that the Department of Defense that, were, that had involvement in the PWMIA issue. And uh, the members of that committee from the military services were flag and general officers. And uh, as the chairman of that, I was in charge of planning for the repatriation of our men, Operation Homecoming, and the execution of Operation Homecoming, and the, the coordination of, of efforts of the military services to support the families of the missing and the prisoners. Um, and so from that point on, and this, was, this was early 1971, uh, we worked on through, and I left the Pentagon in, in that, that role. At the same time, I had some other other uh, obligations. I I uh, was Deputy Assistant Secretary for for International Economic Affairs and Prisoner of War, Missing in Action Affairs, and so I was involved with uh, maintaining uh, a number of issues that were occurring in NATO at the time. We we still had other issues in Vietnam, but uh, obviously. Through 1973 and afterwards, as we tried to to, to account for our missing, uh, that was that was a huge issue, and so that was that was my role. So was so was that role ever done before before you? You were the first one into that position that was newly created. Is that correct? Uh, th that particular position, yes. There had been there had been. Uh, a number of people in the, uh, the in the office of uh, the, the Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs (ISA), who uh, had been charged with monitoring and uh, trying to coordinate the, the PWMIA issue, but it was very clear that that was not working the way it should. The services that had primary responsibilities, obviously, for supporting the families and for uh, uh, other other issues related to them. 
uh, were, were going their own separate ways. There was very little coordination between them. And so the individual military services had their own policies. And it was clear to Secretary Laird that something needed to be done to coordinate those issues, to bring them to, to a central point with senior representatives uh, of the military services. And I said the other, other uh, offices in the Department of Defense that had roles here, manpower, reserve affairs, things like that, medical, um, to coordinate that so that we were all uh, marching to the same uh, uh, drumbeat and uh, doing what we could to maximize our, our resources effectively to support the families and the issues trying to, to get the, the, the uh, prisoners home. Uh, at that time, we were, we were not only interested in Operation Homecoming, but we uh, put out individual initiatives that were supported by the Geneva Conventions relative to the treatment of prisoners of war, such as exchanges of prisoners, um, bringing home uh, long-held prisoners, um, arranging for the for the repatriation of the sick and wounded prisoners of war, things of that nature, and making sure that the uh, North Vietnamese and its communist allies um, obeyed the Geneva Convention rules, which they never did. But we put a lot of pressure on them, and uh, we we were uh, watching what the League of Families and the families of our Michigan prisoners were doing. We encouraged them. We they, they they were not doing what we wanted them to do. They were never under our control, nor did we ever want them to be. That would have taken away a lot of their of their uh, power and, and their and their ability to to make their own initiatives. But we certainly supported what they did, and so uh, we knew what they were doing. They knew what we were doing, and uh, policy was in the Department of Defense uh, under one umbrella, and we moved forward with that on that basis. Okay. And, and so where, where there had been a singular point of contact that was looking at these things, it did not have representatives could, could contact the individual military services on an individual basis. And, um, just, just was not a very good coordinating mechanism. So this, this in February of, of 1971, the Prisoner of War and Missing in Action Task Group was created, and I was the chairman of that group. Did the did the Nixon administration or uh, the Kissinger, did they ever involve you or your task force uh, in the negotiations during the Paris Peace Accords when it come to the POWMIAs? Uh, we were involved in every aspect of it that, that involved the, the prisoner and missing issue. And uh, for a time, I was going to Paris uh, every week. Well, uh, well, at least once a week to to uh, that we we made our initiatives, uh, uh, many of our initiatives through the the the, the uh, group that was meeting there in Paris in the peace talks, and of course when it came time to to put the whole um, Paris peace accords together, uh, we were the ones that that uh, entered the things that that we felt we needed as far as repatriation issues were concerned. Uh, and the uh, efforts to account for the missing after when the repatriation was done. So, yes, we were very much involved with the Paris Peace Talk. Okay. And then uh, moving on into, unless somebody else has something they want to bring up about that. Um, um, I had a question. I'd, I'd love to hear your perspective on, um, you know, I know you were in uh, North Vietnam when the first group of POWs were released, and then you were over there as Laos was also, you know, finalizing their peace agreement later in February. would love to hear kind of in your words what those experiences were like. And then also would love to know when you first found out about the Baron 52. Well, um, I did go up for the first um, release. That was February 12th, 1973. And a few days later, we had a, a release that was described by the North Vietnamese as a gift release, a, a gift to uh, Dr. Kissinger, uh, and it was not part of the, the regular release um, pattern that had been negotiated, but we were very happy to, uh, to bring people home at, at the time. Um, any way that the North Vietnamese were going to release them, the minimum requirement, of course, was for them to follow what we had negotiated and what the peace agreements called for, 
But if they wanted to put people in, as they did with with a, a group of 20 people as a special a release early, we were very happy to have that. And um, I went up for both of those. I, I was there for both of those. The second one was, as I said, off the regular schedule. And there could have been some problems with that because the men themselves who were being held prisoner and were going to be released had been uh, told, according to the Paris Peace Agreement uh, provisions, that uh, they would be released in, in order of sick and wounded and the longest held. And this group, a separate group of 20 was uh, out of that, out of that arrangement. It was, it was uh, beyond that. And so we were concerned that some of those men who wanted to come home with, with honor uh, had been told that they were going to come home in, in the order that I described. I uh, might have some issues about that. And, and then frankly, they did. I went up for the second release, and we, we uh, uh, after a few minutes of talking, I, I sent a, a, a colonel, a senior uh, Air Force officer, into uh, Hanoi, to the Hanoi Hilton, where he explained to the, uh, to Colonel Norman Gaddis that um, this release was legitimate and we wanted the men to come home, and so that, that went very well. Uh, both of those releases, uh, you can only... Uh, in your in your wildest imaginations, never realized how great it was to, to see men. There, a couple of them were were uh, ambul were not ambulatory. Uh, some B Y uh, B fifty two tail gunners who had um, some extensive injuries. Uh, the planes that we sent up there, the C one forty ones, to bring them back to Clark Air Force Base, had a a seat and a bed for every individual because we didn't know what their physical condition would be. Um, most of them, all, all but these two tail gunners, were were ambulatory. Um, after seven years, eight years, without without much contact with families, in some cases almost none. Uh, you can only imagine what it was like, and uh, it was obviously a great moment in my life that that I will remember forever, over fifty years ago. But it would seems like yesterday from that standpoint. I'm sure. And then regarding and regarding Laos, we did not renegotiate. I, I, I want to make it clear that Laos was included in the Paris Peace Accords. The fact that they did not release anyone from Laos and, and contended at the time uh, that, that the release was going on, that, that it did not include Laos, was incorrect. Laos was always included. It was very important to us, as, as was Cambodia. As anywhere, we actually had a couple of men held in China, and there was an individual still held in China from, from the Korean War. Uh, all those were, were part of the agreement and very, very important to us. And mm -hmm. so they were included in the Paris Peace Accords, and we never acknowledged the fact that they were outside that accord. When, when they were not included, we put pressure on North Vietnam to put them back in, which subsequently they did. But the result of, of what we got in terms of release from Laos was very, very disappointing. Absolutely. Yeah, wasn't wasn't it didn't kiss when Kissinger was uh negotiate negotiating with Lee Doc Toe there, the DRV, um, I know I read a bunch of documents out of the Kissinger papers that was talking about how they were negotiating Laos as a separate as a separate deal because Lee Doc Toe wouldn't speak for Laos. Well, we were we were we were we were negotiating, um, if you mean by that talking, but we were not negotiating a separate accord. We were negotiating to make sure that they agreed and that they did uh, comply with with the Paris Peace Accord. So that's what the negotiation was. It was not about how to bring the men home who had not been included. They were included, and and the North Vietnamese broke that peace accord by not releasing them. Okay. And so what our negotiation was at that time was to, to, to make sure that they put them back in the accord as the accord required. Um, the North Vietnamese, and you, you know what happened subsequent to that, that, we never had an accounting. We had a full accounting in the Paris Peace Agreement. Um, we never renegotiated those agreements. We negotiated the, the, the efforts that we had, if you want to call them negotiations, to bring the, the, the North Vietnam um, group, it's North Vietnam and its allies, back into to compliance with, with the Paris Accords, which they never came back into. 
but but Laos was always included, and the um, a- after the men after the, the the final individual in the in the re- regular repatriations was repatriated uh, on April first, which was outside the, the agreement. It was supposed to have been finished by that time when our uh, phase out of our troops was completed. North Vietnam contacted us uh, on the, that at that time and said, you know, there's a man. There's an American uh, prisoner of war down in the the um, in South Vietnam and in the um, Mekong Delta area. We hadn't been able to communicate with our people down there, so we didn't know that he was there. So he was not on the list that we gave you in January. And uh, if you like, you go down there and please pick him up. So we we uh, we did that. We set a helicopter down and and picked up the last man who was an army helicopter pilot who had been held down in South Vietnam. So, so there were those issues that, that, that came up, but, uh, we, we never had them outside. As I said, they were always included in the Paris peace accords. We would never have agreed to anything in the Paris peace accords that did not include Laos and Cambodia completely. And, and when did, if I may, when did Baron 52 impact on any of the procedures as far as you can recollect? It didn't really impact on the procedures. The the, uh, the, the, the people that were lost at that time, because of, of Vietnam's recalcitrance, we, we continued our military efforts in both Cambodia and Laos, and that Baron 52 was part of that, uh, part of that issue. The, the, the men had, had North Vietnam abided by the Paris Peace Agreements, and had had um, we we not had the military conflict that continued in that way, which which should not have done. Again, that was contrary to the peace accords. Um, the people that were lost would n- would never have been lost in in uh, in the Baron Fifty Two incident. And when the Baron Fifty Two incident occurred, uh, we knew that that North Vietnam was not ab- abiding by the agreements, and so we. We um, talked about what we would do. In fact, in, in, in the United States Senate, Senator Dole introduced a bill, a bill, excuse me, that said we will continue uh, our military uh, efforts and have the right to to, uh, to take military action if we do not have compliance with, with the uh, peace accords. The uh, United States Senate at that time was controlled by, by people who had no interest in Vietnam at all. Uh, as soon as as soon as Operation Homecoming was over, um, mm-hmm. our military support to South Vietnam evaporated. The, the yeah. senators that, that uh, and, and the House that refused to provide continuing military support at, at an adequate level for South Vietnam said, we have a peace agreement. And of course, until 1975, when Saigon fell, there, there was nominally a peace agreement. And in fact, the last person uh, that was that was killed in action in the field in South Vietnam was a man who in December, uh, November I guess it was of 1973, was part of of a of a graves registration team. We were doing this unilaterally because the North Vietnamese and its allies had not complied with the missing, and so we had undertaken in areas that we felt were were safe uh, mm-hmm. in South Vietnam to look at the sites where we last had missing or or prisoners that we carried as prisoner. And so this graves registration team, we had notified the North Vietnamese and the the Viet Cong that we were going to be doing this. And they were out in the field. We were looking at a a helicopter site that that, uh, we had not been able to look at before. The team was unarmed. It was ambushed by a group of of, of Viet Cong and Captain Richard Reese was killed. And so the last field casualty was a result of our efforts to account for our, our, our people. But we wouldn't have had to do that had they, had they agreed to uh, and made their commitments, uh, executed their commitments under the Paris Peace Accords. And Baron 52 would not have been involved. Uh, we wouldn't have been sending out those, those missions. And if something had gone wrong, the, the uh, North Vietnamese would have uh, done what they should have done, and the Laotians, uh, under the false rubric of, 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 a, of a separate Laotian group, which of course was never true, uh, they were always under the command of the North Vietnamese, 
But um, had that happened, uh, had they committed themselves and executed their their commitments, they would have told us what happened to that crash site, and we would have to get into it uh, for more than a, a minute or two as 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 it, as it happened. Uh, we we did and indeed have a. Uh, and an inspection, a, a very brief inspection, right after the uh, incident occurred, to see what what uh, we could find out about those men. And uh, of course, they were under fire, and we were not able to to continue that inspection. But uh, had the Paris peace agreements been been adhered to by by the communists, Baron Fifty Two wouldn't have happened. And if for some reason we had had a plane over Laos go down, we had we. We were sending a, a, a C-130 up to North Vietnam from Saigon uh, with a team of, of North Vietnamese, the preliminary, preliminary revolutionary government of Vietnam, the PRG, and so forth, to uh, talk about the accounting. It was it was it was not effective. It was it was simply a, a, a formal thing because we were never able to do any accounting on that group. But they were up there. And had they gone down, had that well, that C-130 for one reason or another, it was traveling to Hanoi every week, gone down, the North Vietnamese would have been under the obligation to tell us what happened to it and to allow us in to, 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 to see what happened, if there were survivors or what, what the circumstances of, of the loss were. And that would have happened with Baron 52, but it didn't. And, and, and was Dr. Kissinger directly informed of Baron 52? Dr. Kissinger, what, what happened with Baron 52, just a, a quick background on that. Baron 52 was lost in the, in the first few days in February. Um, at the time that it was lost, there was, a, there was an intercept occurring just about the same time from a, a, a North Vietnamese military unit saying we shot down uh, a plane and we, and we captured four air pirates. Uh, that was in the vicinity, not not immediately in the vicinity, but it was close enough to where Baron 52 went down, and we knew where Baron 52 went down. But but the the site of of, of the military unit that that had made this this um, communication to to the North Vietnamese military command was intercepted by one of our one of our uh, electronic eavesdroppers. And they talked about the the uh, that they had captured just captured four air pirates mm -hmm. in the inspection of the of the Baron Fifty Two crash site. The, there were four there were eight individuals crew members of that of Baron Fifty Two. Mm -hmm. The the inspection that we did under under hostile fire uh was able to establish that there were that at least four of the individuals on that aircraft had not survived. And there were, mm -hmm. the, the, the inspectors were not able to continue and to inspect the, the site the way they should have to, to go through the plane uh, wreckage completely. And so we had no information at all on, on what happened to the other four people. So we thought that they said they'd captured four people. The North Vietnamese said they'd captured four people. We had four dead that we knew for sure of in this Baron 52, and there were a possibility, was a possibility, that four others may have survived. As I said, it was close to that area, and the North Vietnamese had, had frequently referred to captured American um, crew members as air pirates. And so that made Baron 52 a very, very unique, very unique incident. We had had other, other. We in fact, there had been many intercepts where the North Vietnamese would talk about downing American aircraft, U.S. aircraft. Uh, in some of those cases, they were simply bragging with each other because mm -hmm. they would describe an incident that never happened and talk about it on a day that no one was ever lost. Mm -hmm. Other cases, they would describe something that was very accurate, and we agreed with it. Dr. Kissinger, of course, knew about this. The White House knew about this because I, I personally informed the uh, military assistant to the president on a regular basis of anything, of any note, and to me this was a particular note, and so the White House knew all about this. So you knew about it pretty much as soon as it happened? It was reported as, as I said, this this was very very unique. Yeah. Um, 
We 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 had we were in the middle. Uh, eight days later, on February the twelfth, we were going yeah. to begin the repatriation <laughs> under the under the Obligated. under the Operation Homecoming. Yeah. Uh, and so the fact that 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 we had a peace agreement, so as I said, was supposed to include everyone. We shouldn't have been losing anybody. Yeah. And so the fact that we had a plane shot down in Laos, uh, and 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 that, that, that you know at that point in time we did not realize what the North Vietnamese were up to by saying that Laos was outside the agreement. And so we we knew that after the ceasefire agreement at the end of January took place, they had shot down an aircraft. Mm-hmm. And we knew that, that, that they had, that, that one unit had said we have four air pirates. And so mm-hmm. to me, we we had a very, very unique situation because, as I said, it was in the area where the plane was mm-hmm. lost. Uh, we had four people on Baron 52 that we knew had not survived. Four out of eight, the possibility that four may have survived. Four that corresponded to the, to the four air pirates that we captured outside the Paris agreements, which should never have happened, was, was, was a, a violation of the ceasefire agreement and very, very unique to us. And so it was something that we knew immediately. Uh, and we even from the Department of Defense sent over uh, a message that said that, that perhaps we should continue our military action. We were not bombing. Baron 52 was not a bomber. Yeah, yeah. It was not, it was not involved in, in, in killing anyone on the ground. And so yeah. we, we said that perhaps we were going to have to continue action. So yes, the, 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 the White House knew all about this. And I was told about this immediately. As soon as it happened, it came over to me immediately. Are you aware of what type of intel the uh, Defense Intelligence Agency was able to acquire? Uh, we have many documents from uh, researchers for the Senate Select Committee that imply that the Defense Intelligence Agency, uh, for some reason, placed four of the Baron 52 crew into the, what is now known as the KK status, which meant captured and then eventually died in captivity. But um, whenever we try to find out how they were able to do that, we come up with silence. And, and watching the testimony, uh, I, I believe it was a day which you sat near to Mr. Trowbridge. He explained how he had uh, their teams with every branch of service, and they fed whatever intel those teams acquired to the particular branch of service that the, the missing person came from. But um, we're, we're still left uh, with a lot of questions as to how the Defense Intelligence Agency, which I know you can't speak for them, but we're still left to question how they had their their accounting system, um, aside from the service uh, accounting system that contradicted one another. Are you able to speak to anything, uh, anything about that uh, by way of an opinion? Because I know you can't speak for them directly. Well, the, 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 Senate, the Senate committee um, was, was full of consternation and, and I just could not understand how how DIA could carry someone on their roles as prisoner when the military services didn't. The status, the official status of an individual was made by the individual service secretary. By law, the service secretary had to do that. In the mm-hmm. case of Baron 52, not long after the, 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 the initial incident, the Air Force reviewed the uh, circumstances of loss and made their recommendation to their own service secretary. And in this case, it was a recommendation to change the status from missing in action, which was the original original status, to killed in action. So officially, on the records of, of, of the military services, defense, as far as any official statistics were concerned, those men were killed in action. Uh, I... I I, I believe that the, that the Air Force was wrong in making that determination as soon as they did. 
because I, I, I think, as I said, the uniqueness of that situation and the fact that we had not been able to, to, to fully vet the whole, the whole thing, to, to have a full inspection and to, to go through. You know, there, there were issues in there. For example, the location of the, of, the, of the military group of the North Vietnamese that reported the action. They reported it up, uh, and their, their own location was, was um, a, a fairly big distance. I, I don't know exactly. At the time, we didn't know exactly how many miles it was from where the plane went down, from where Baron 52 went down. But it was close enough so that, that, that you could imagine a situation in which the plane had been hit. Uh, if it had been on a course that would have taken it close to where this this North Vietnamese unit was that claimed the capture, and the the aircraft commander could have told four of the members of the crew uh, get out of the airplane because we're not going to be able to keep the plane flying. Uh, that's all. That that's just something you know, and that you 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 think of in your mind um, that that could have happened. My own feeling was. That, that we did not know the specifics of, of these things. We did not know the location. We did not know the path of Baron 52 with exactness. Uh, there were issues. Someone told me later on that, that the issue was, was maybe they didn't really describe them as air pirates. Um, at the time that the determination to change the status was made and the status change was made by the Air Force Secretary, those kinds of things had not been had not been cleaned up, and so I felt that the Air Force was premature in making that that status change. But DIA, to, to, to make this clear, and this isn't speaking for DIA. I mean, this is uh, every everyone that was involved in, in the prisoner and missing issue knew this. The the uh, what, what information DIA had, the military services also had. The, the, there was no intelligence that one kept group kept from another. So anything that DIA knew, the Air Force knew. Mm-hmm. There was a difference of interpretation. If 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 they and I'm I can't speak for the fact that the, the DIA had them as 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 uh, as captured, but I do know that there were some people that the DIA uh, carried in their own files as captured when the military services had them killed in action. And they did that with with my concurrence and my approval and my intense gratitude because we did not know. We had two individuals who had been declared killed in action who were returned during Operation Homecoming. One of them had a situation, a Navy um, crew member had, had been declared killed in action, but we knew later on he was there for seven and a half years, something like that. We knew later while he was still a prisoner of war that he had been captured and his status was changed. Uh, There was a Marine uh, named named Ridgeway, Sergeant Ridgeway, who had been, uh, we thought, killed in action outside of Quezon. And in fact, he he was buried uh, in a a military cemetery in St. Louis. His name was on a column because his remains were were commingled and they were not able to establish the fact Mm -hmm. of the individual identity of, of, of remains. Uh, Sergeant Ridgeway came home and his name was taken off of that, that marker <laughs> in yep. St. Louis. Mm. There was another, another member of a, of a, a, a CH-46, a helicopter, a Chinook helicopter that was downed in Laos um, that had been carried as missing in action and from whom, about whom we had heard nothing. Uh, and uh, C.S. was his name. And he was returned when they when they finally agreed to, to do something about Laos. Uh, he was one of the very few people that was returned. We had no information about him. I don't know, 1968, 67, 68, something like that, until until he was returned. And and we were very surprised when his name came up on the list. It was on the list. So so DIA, we not knowing what the real status of an MIA was. DIA determined that, that they would perhaps look at things differently and in their own investigations, if they heard something somewhere else, it might correspond to someone who, who had been on a KIA list. 
And if the people on the KIA list were all removed from, from anything DIA had, they may fail to make that correlation. And so DIA, to, to make sure that they did not lose any information regarding anyone, uh, w- was able to, to carry on their list someone as, as a live prisoner of war, but that was not an official status. Uh, the services knew of this. And uh, whatever, and I, and I don't know that this pertains to, to Baron 52 at all, but, but that's what DIA was allowed to do. But there was no difference in what DIA knew and what any of the military services knew. So whatever documents you think are there and, and, and where they are and so forth and so on, um, you, you, if, if you talk to DIA about that, uh, you would find out whether they did that or not. But but as far as I know, no one ever had official knowledge that people survived from Baron 52, nor did they at that time from the, from, from the, the, the people that, that were initially discovered to be dead. No one knew for sure that the, that, that the other members had, had, uh, had died. Well, how does one go about entering the DIA with these questions? Because senators can't seem to do it. The Secretary of the Air Force chose not to do it. They referred me back to DPMO, and I have that in a letter. So whenever we ask about the DIA, uh, everybody clams up. And uh, I don't know of any office within the DIA that is open for business for family members to dial in. So we're left holding nothing but speculatory documents that have alluded to other documents that the DIA had that we'll never see, but it was given to the Senate Select Committee. So um, I, I don't know. I'm asking a question that I know there is no answer to. So I'm not asking you to answer that, Dr. <laughs> Shields, but you can understand our frustration. Well, you know, obviously, I, I can't, uh, you know, obviously, I can't answer that because I, I don't know now. I, after I left in 1976, uh, up until 1976, uh, I'm sure I knew as much as, as, as DIA knew at that time. Uh, to me, that was still a very open issue. I did not, uh, like DIA, when, when the Air Force went KIA on these men, uh, I kept notes on the case myself of Baron 52 because I thought that the issue in my own mind had not, had not been looked at. And had we had an accounting process, that would have been one of the first things that I, if not the first thing that I would have gone to look at. There were two other individuals that we know were, were captured and were in prison in, in Laos in, in the, in the uh, uh, Sam Nua uh, area, the, 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 uh, the, the area of the caves that, that we knew were, were prisoners of war and had, and had survived their, their loss of, of their aircraft. Uh, nothing had been heard from them for a long time before the the, the conflict ended. Uh, but they had been carried, and I think the last man and last individual uh, was Air Force, and and that had been carried as prisoner of war before status changes had been made to presume from their findings of death uh, was was Laos, one man in Laos, and so so. Um, those those kinds of issues were still there. I, I as of as of November, I, I I would have a hard time believing that DIA held back anything from me. I don't know what their what their what their motive would have been. Uh, and and I and I, I the only thing I can say is that that when these findings of of, of, of a state change in status were 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 made and determined, it was a matter of interpretation. The Air Force looked at what they had and, and, and convinced the service secretary, the people in the Air Force personnel who had looked at this, convinced the service secretary that, that the, there were no survivors from Baron 52. Uh, I had, had, had I been the service secretary, I would not have been convinced. Uh, and I would not have made the, 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 the status change. But, uh, but I, I think that, 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 uh, the information that I had, I, I don't think that there was anyone who would have had any reason to keep information from me uh, because I don't ever believe that there was a conspiracy. 
Uh, I just think that there are issues that, that are never going to be cleaned up. As I said, we know that we had people who were captured. And I can only assume that among the, the hundreds of missing that we had at the end of the conflict, that we were never, never able to, to have a satisfactory accounting for, that there are probably people on, on, on among those who were also captured that we never knew about. And, and I suspect we never will know. Um, and, and, and that's, that's the tragedy of this, of this whole situation. We did not get, the, the U.S. Senate did not accept the Dole uh, proposal legislation and so we had no military pressure to put on, on, uh, on, on any of the communists. And as you know, they violated the treaty completely, so much so that they took over South Vietnam. Mm-hmm. And they took over Laos. And, and the United States of America looked the other way while that was happening. I don't think it, it reflects well on the United States Congress. You know, their comment at the time was, I think it was Senator Mansfield who said, we... We, if we continue military action to find out what happened, and he didn't, he didn't cite Baron Fifty Two, but but I would, I would, I would cite that on my own to say about things like Baron Fifty Two, to keep military actions until we were able to go in and uh, establish for ourselves what happened. Uh, Senator Mansfield said, if we were going to do that, we we're just going to produce more missing in action. So the idea that we never left men behind, um, you know, that's in the eye of the of, of the beholder um, so the law of the uh, returns i think is what we're talking about here mm-hmm. yeah well what we you know what, what, we're, what we're talking about was the united states congress that was sick and tired of vietnam that's perhaps the whole country was i don't know i don't know how the country would have felt about that you know today everybody's a hero um and, and so we want to do everything for the heroes that was not the case at the end of the vietnam war and so Congress was content after after they thought that we had everyone home to to take away the 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 military support financial support from South mm-hmm. Vietnam. Mm-hmm. There was no U.S. military fighting anymore after April first, nineteen seventy three. And the only thing I can say when someone asks me, could North South Vietnam have have held their own and maintained their their country sovereignty if 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 the United States had maintained its its support as we're doing right now with Ukraine. The answer to that is I don't know and we never will know because we didn't do it. But I do know that without that support, there was no way South Vietnam could have succeeded and they didn't. Mm -hmm. Yep. We don't know what we don't know. Yep. So and 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 a lot of this and, and a lot of this, unfortunately, we will, we will never find out. And as I tell you, as I say, you know, in the case of the of, of four members of that crew, um, I, I, I'm not c- completely up to date on on what has been found since that time. Uh, what what all we did to to clarify that whole issue, but I do know that there were other people that were alive, as I said, that were alive and were prisoners of war. And whose status today has never been clarified, and that goes for two people that we know were alive in 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 North Vietnam, or excuse me, in Laos, were alive in Sam Nua in a prison in Sam Nua province. Um, we've been told by the Laos that they died. Their remains have not been recovered. Um, despite efforts by the people who are now, you know, in, involved in that to recover those those remains, they have not been recovered. You know, we were told, you know, maybe maybe be 52 bomb strikes destroyed the remains and the graves and so forth. But we don't know. But we do know that those two people were there. And had we had an accounting at the time of the end of the Vietnam War, 1973, would have known a lot more than we did now. And there were people in South Vietnam, Cambodia. And as I say, among the missing that we know nothing about, I'm sure that, that, that someone somewhere was probably captured and we'll never know. Yeah, I just want to say, uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Shields, for your whole involvement, um, you know, in the homecoming. Um, you know, and, and those on Baron 52 were eager to see 
the POW is coming home. Joe writes in his last letter that to my parents, I know John received another letter, but to my parents, he said, um, it must, you know, in that week from the signing and his shoot down, I wonder how long the ceasefire will last with no incidents. Can't wait until they release all of the POWs too. I'll be real happy to see that. It's hard to believe it's all over. Um, so they were rooting for all of the POWs to come home and we are glad we know your part in that. And it was just a wonderful thing um, that you helped um, you know, bring to fruition. And I'm glad to see that there is something 50 years later that there's still a reunion of the remaining POWs, you know, with that dinner that you mentioned. Uh, we were surprised and dismayed to see little made of it earlier, you know, on the actual anniversary of the signing. So um, again, thank you very much. And, um, you know, we do hope someday to bring Joe home and to find out what happened. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I, I, I feel the same way and endorse your, your feelings. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Burn 52 Mystery Podcast. Join us next week as we continue the story and interview Senator Robert Smith about the Senate Select Committee hearings on POWMIAs. Thank you for listening. Flag so proudly hail. Be proud of this America. Realize we failed. To bring our Home.